so uh, this book, Peter, just full of so sunshine and roses, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, like, look, it's a great time to be alive, but it's kind of artificial, right? Let's let's talk about that. I want to talk about, one, why it's a great time to be alive, because the rest of the episode can be about how this is all falling apart. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it all has to do with globalization. Uh, in the world before World War II, we had an imperial system with the empires duking it out over access to everything, and trade as a rule needed to be militarized because every time there was a conflict, you would lose access to whatever happened, even if you weren't a party to the conflict. Uh, shipping would be a target. So at the end of World War II, the Americans, who had the only Navy left in the game, said that they would put their Navy at the service of the global commons so that anyone could trade with anyone anywhere at any time and access any market. And we came to know this as free trade and globalization. Now, there are two big implications from that. The first is that we were no longer in a world where if you wanted to be successful, you had to have iron ore and coal and steel and food. You only needed one of them now and you could trade for the other three, and everyone started to industrialize together, uh, starting from different points and moving at different speeds, but we all got on this path that we are all now very familiar with. And second, when people industrialized, <coughs> they changed their personal habits and national economies evolved as well. So it used to be that you were probably living on a subsistence farm. And when you okay. do that, kids are free labor. So you have a bunch. But when you move into the town to take industrial and services jobs, kids go from being free labor to really expensive habits, and adults aren't stupid, so we had fewer of them. You play mm. that forward seven. You mean fewer years. kids? Fewer kids or fewer expensive habits? Or are those the same Different thing? expensive habits, fewer kids. I got it. Yeah. Uh, you play that forward 75 years, and it's not that most of the world is running out of children. That happened 30 years ago. It's that now the world has run out of working age adults and we're starting to run out of mature adults. Everyone's moving into mass retirement. So from a strategic point of view, globalization was based on America's commitment to the Cold War, which is long since over. And economically, the industrialization experience, the urbanization experience has been about this bulge moving through the population structure that started with children, then turned into 20 and 30 somethings that was consumption heavy, then turned into 40 and 50 somethings, which were capital heavy, people saving for retirement. And now they're all moving into retirement. So the whole process has already played out. And under globalization, first with a lot of capital, I'm sorry, first with a lot of workers, then with a lot of capital, we got the technological explosions that we know but these were all nothing more than a moment in time, a moment that lasted 75 years, but right. it's now over. And so we now have to go back to what we had before World War II, but without people. That doesn't sound possible. It's not great. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. I was like, what? I'm missing a piece here where this actually can possibly happen without suddenly inventing robots that can replace <laughs> tons of people well, robots overnight that are also robots affordable. Don't consume, they can only produce. Ah, uh, I see, right. So we're only, that we, we could fix half the equation with one miracle, and then we need a different miracle to fix the we second half of the equation. We need cloning, cloning. Right, right, okay. So you've said the 2020s are gonna see a collapse in many categories. Let's explore that because I think we, we've we've spoken before about globalization, not necessarily you and I, but just we as in people can't shut up about how great globalization is. And then we had the pandemic and it was like, oh, shoot, globalization, that thing that means we can't get things now. And the, a shipping ship got stuck in a cargo ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal. And suddenly we realize how fragile this system is. And it sounds so fragile that it's hard to believe how fragile it actually is. And, and none of us are looking at shipping. I've done shows on shipping and it's like, it's the wild west only if things break, the entire world is totally screwed. <laughs> I don't think it's quite that positive. <laughs> no, uh, quite that, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, the key thing to keep in mind for shipping, let, let me throw it into three general categories. Number one, 80% of the stuff that enables people to grow food is transported internationally whether it's equipment or fertilizer or fuel. Only 20% of food is traded internationally, but 80% you need the inputs to grow it in the first place. Uh, number two, um, roughly half of all oil is shipped on the ocean blue, typically uh, by supertanker, along with everything that comes out of the Persian Gulf. 
And then number three, safety on the waves is what allows us to have the East Asian manufacturing model, which is a fancy way of saying the manufacturing model because roughly half of all manufactured goods are produced in East Asia. And you will get components coming from Thailand versus Indonesia versus China versus Korea versus Japan. But the key thing to remember is less than 1% of that shipping happens on land. Korea is wow. an effective I... an island. Japan is an island. Most of the Southeast Asian countries are either islands or peninsulas and they're ringed by mountains. So physical connections independent of maritime trade in Asia almost don't happen at all. Wow. So we are totally, totally, totally dependent on these boats being able to get from one place to another, not get stuck in canals, not get attacked by pirates, having oil at a decent, somewhat reasonable price to be able to transport other oil and other goods, and also just logistics and other things not getting totally screwed up. And if any one of those things gets out of, out of whack in this ecosystem, suddenly Tickle Me Elmo is not available for Christmas and there's tears all over the world. Uh, certainly. Uh, and, you know, the, the book is about how this happens on a decade's time scale, how the 2020s mm -hmm. were always the decade that it was always going to break down in. But events in just the last couple of months are speeding this up. A lot of this is probably going to be front loaded. So, like, think of what just happened in the first week of December. So the Europeans announced their plan for an oil export ban, and a lot of the details are being made up as they go on. It's, it's a very European policy in that regard. Uh, but what it is encouraging is a split in the way we view oil from the Russian space versus the rest of the world, and the different types of crude coming out of the Russian space. So the stuff the Europeans are primarily concerned about is Ural's crude that is exported west to the European space, and that can only be sold for $60 or less now. Um, and that's affecting insurance and shipping rates and the type of vessels that go in. And we saw mm -hmm. over the course of the last two years how disruptions in simply the type of vessel being available can generate supply chain snarls. So now we're doing this with energy. But there's also a crude grade that exports to the Pacific that doesn't touch the European space at all, that trades differently. We now, just in the Russian space, have two fundamentally different markets, not just for pricing, but for physical accessibility, for the ability to get ships and insurance to allow it to move. We, one of the reasons why the world has been so stable, air quotes stable, uh, since 1945, is there's been one oil price. Now, it's modified by the length of the journey or the quality of the crude, but there's one oil price and everything is safe. The Europeans have now created a system where a lot of countries in Europe are now going to have a vested interest in interfering with Russian exports west. That's one pricing margin. That's one security paradigm. That's one insurance policy system. But then in the east where the Europeans are not the players, it's a different crude grade at a different price point using different insurance systems by different countries. We have split the oil market now into at least three pieces, two Russian, one everything else, which means now countries no longer have a vested interest in making sure the oil flows everywhere all the time because we're not all in this together anymore. Right, right. Okay, so when it was, if everything was plug and play, if all the outlets were the same, to use a, a, an electrical analogy, we would say, hey, we need to secure this system. And the United States would guarantee security for all that. But if it's like, well, our stuff works, and then the other side, it doesn't work for us even if we wanted it to. And that no to. longer matters to us. Right, and no longer, so now we don't need to have the U.S. Navy protect shipping routes for some other country, and, because why should we? It's not gonna do anything We're for gonna us. see this spread throughout not just the energy sphere, but pretty much every major commodity, and we're hiving the world up into different supply systems. And that is a recipe for 1910s and 1930s style conflict and competition. So I don't think a lot of people, and I, it took me reading the book to actually know this as well, I didn't realize what role the United States played in securing shipping routes. I think, I think most people, myself included, before reading your book, really thought, I don't know, ships leave and they go somewhere and then they come back and it's fine. I, I, I didn't realize, it's not like, you don't look at the people maintaining the highways, right? You just kind of think, why is this under construction again? You know, and it's that way with the ocean, only it takes up the majority of the space on the entire planet and it's a lot harder to secure and maintain. Yeah, in the world before World War II, piracy, state piracy and privateering were pretty common. Uh, because really? almost everything that was shipped had an obvious value. Uh, the cost of shipping before the Cold War and globalization was about an order of magnitude more than it was 
um, previous. And in the pre-industrial world, it was an order of magnitude more than that. In the pre-deep water era, it was an order of magnitude more. So interfering with shipping has always been very popular because you know that the value of the product is going to be high. It's only in the post World War II era that the cost of shipping has dropped so much that we put everything on the waves. So that's intermediate right, okay. manufacturing, that's low value added commodities, uh, things that normally you would produce and consume locally. It used to be it was all pretty much luxury goods or something of very high value. Now it's a little bit of Right, everything. so it, it was a ship full of gold, not a ship full of knockoff iPhone chargers that get, catch on fire if they're plugged well, in. Well, and for not too even long. the knockoff iPhone chargers, the components that might go into the knockoff iPhone chargers. Right. Right. The thing that catches on the thing that's job is to catch on fire after three hours of use. Yeah, that, that it's a ship full of those. So that that was surprising to me. Right. Because the United States is securing or, or I guess is still securing all of these trade routes for the most part. We're kind of in this the soft open. moment in, in history where everyone's holding their breath and wondering if the next time there's an incident, the U.S. is going to intervene or not. And, and I'd argue that the answer is no. Uh, part of this is really? political. The Biden administration is the most populist administration we have ever had, more so than Trump. Uh, basically, it feels like on trade policy, <clears throat> the Biden administration is going through Trump's tweets and picking them out one at a time and expanding them into position papers and putting them into policy and running a really good grammar scr scrubber over it. Uh, and basically, we're basically getting the second Trump administration right now from a trade point of view. Uh, and then second, even if we wanted to in intervene, this isn't the 60s or 70s. Uh, I mean, it used to be that there were other, no other naval powers. And so the United States with the destroyer heavy Navy after World War II could patrol the global oceans because there wasn't a lot of competition and we had the right tools for the job. But since 1990, we've retooled our Navy, we've retired most of our smaller vessels, and we've concentrated naval power into our supercarrier battle groups. And if you want to knock off a country, that is the tool. But if you want to patrol the global oceans in an environment where other people have ships, you don't need the dozen super, super carrier battle groups we have. You need like 800 destroyers. We only have 70. So oh, wow. even if we wanted to be the global policeman and patrol the waves, we no longer have the physical capacity to do it. Now, that sounds bad, and it is, but keep this in mind. The United States is the least maritime trade dependent country in the world. Only 12% of our GDP is from trade. About half of that is NAFTA. So we're not the ones who suffer if global trade, trade breaks down. China is at mm -hmm. the top of that list. Europe is a close second. China is at the top of the list, you said? Yeah, China utterly lacks the naval capacity to project power more than about a thousand miles from its coast and it is completely dependent upon resource access and market access in countries that are half a world away. Right, I see. So, and if you look at a map, which I've I've done a lot of recently, especially when reading your book, because I'm thinking, wait, you know, which way does this go? You look at China and you go, oh, they have great access to uh, Russia. Okay, <laughs> except you have to go over this huge amount of nothing and, ma and t tundra to get to Anywhere. what I assume is not not really a great market because it's this, the, the Russian economy before the Ukraine conflict was what the size of Italy, so not really what China needs to feed the. I, I was going to say feed the dragon. It sounds a little bit weird. Maybe I'm going to get canceled for that. But you need to you need a bigger market. You need to get to Europe. You need to get to the United States. You can't do that over land. You need to do it with ships. If China can't really get even around the corner to Vietnam or much further than that, they've got a big, big problem. And the Vietnamese hate them. So, yes, yeah, there's that, too. Yeah, <laughs> they've got other problems, too. But the, one of the one of the problems is they have an aircraft carrier that looks like it's made out of cardboard and everything on it is hidden, uh, which is not really a good sign for them it's actually having an aircraft carrier. not quite that bad. Now, the Chinese currently have three aircraft carriers floating. The first one used to be a casino. Uh, that they converted, they will never claim that that an is actual an casino. actual casino in Ukraine. Yeah, they will never claim wow. that it is combat capability, co combat capable. They just bought it from Ukraine to refurbish it so they could learn how it works. Mm. Their second one is a clone of the one that used to be the casino. Uh, the one that used to be the casino used to be a Russian carrier. They called it the Kuzinov, by the way, and the Soviets thought it was a disaster during Soviet times with Soviet resources. It, it just kind of caught on fire from time to time. Uh, okay. Anyway, so the Chinese do not claim that these two will ever be combat capable. 
they're, okay. they're training for their engineers mm -hmm. more than anything else. And they do have a third one that they're going through sea trials right now. Uh, and it is a larger carrier that they actually designed themselves. But again, it's a prototype. They don't view it as anything other than a test bed. So they might get their first carrier in 2027. Okay. And then it's, and even then, I mean, they probably have a lot of ground to catch up on uh, in terms of making something like that work. A floating city airport. Yeah, with, it's, it's uh, a lot working, more difficult than rocket yeah. science. Yeah. It, it, it's multiple rockets on multiple vehicles, and you got to keep the thing running with a nuclear propulsion system and all that kind of stuff. You write in the book about the geography of success, right? Old time European countries had this. The United States seems to be in a good position with this. It's kind of like the opposite of China having water on one side, mountains, tundra, Russia, et cetera, on the other side and having to go through Central Asia to get anything done. Well, let's do the comparison here. So you've got the greater Midwest, which is the world's largest single chunk of arable land in the world, high agricultural productivity. It's directly overlain by the greater Mississippi system, which is the largest natural transport network in the world. And if you compare a modern super highway system like the American internet or interstate system to moving things by water, uh, the cost of operation is about one twelfth to do it by water versus land. So we've got the, the best waterway network on the best bulk production zone. Uh, we've got more port potential on just the east coast of the United States than the rest of the world combined. The, in, oh, wow. the internal no waterway idea. network is bigger than all of the internal waterway networks of the rest of the world combined. Really? Um, Canada's on the other side of a bunch of deep lakes and forests. Mexico's on the other side of some mountains and some deserts. And we've got ocean moats. So great economic potential, great defensive potential. China technically is a larger country than the United States, but about two thirds of its land is either too hot or too dry or too hot, cold uh, to be inhabitable. So 95% of the population lives on one third of the land. Of that 95%, 70% lives in the North China Plain, which is an area that's not much bigger than, oh, the United States east of the Mississippi, maybe about two thirds the size of that. So you're talking a billion people in one footprint. That footprint is flood prone, drought prone, and the river is actually, after 3,000 years of habitation, the river bed is above the surrounding land area, so it just flows down a dike. So if they get a heavy rain, the dike overflows and the river goes down into where people live. Oh, yikes. It, yeah, so when you hear about flooding in northern China, just run. It's like, <laughs> there, there's no fix here. Uh, so the land is relatively low pro productivity. Uh, in the south, you've got tropics and you've got mountains, so it's difficult to have integration. Hong Kong has always been a separatist area, even before it was called Hong Kong. And then you've got mountains and jungles separating it from Southeast Asia and India. But then you've got the great wide open of the Eurasian steppe connecting it to the Russian space. And off the coast, you don't have an ocean of moat. You've got all these secondary powers, Taiwan, Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan. And so China has never been able to penetrate out. But because they have a hard time unifying at home, others have often penetrated in. It's not the worst geography in the world. That's probably Afghanistan, but it's definitely in the bottom 10%. And it's only because the Americans unified the world into globalization that China exists as it does today, because we basically told all the countries that were preying on China to go home. Hell, we nuked Japan to underline that point. And so for the first time in Chinese history, the Han Chinese have been able to develop the way that they wanted to. And then Nixon and Mao had their summit and brought China into the globalized system to bring it away from the Russians. So I don't want to suggest that the Chinese played no role in their own success, but without the change in the strategic environment of Eisenhower and then ultimately Nixon, none of this would have ever happened. So China's got pretty bad geography, but they also have a demographic collapse issue that seems Worst like... In the world. And, and we. I'm going to do a, a whole show on demographic collapse so we can just be brief with it and do a, like a 10,000 foot over, overview. But this is the worst, you said, the worst demographic collapse in the world. And that does, I assume that even includes Russia, which is currently throwing all of its, any young man it can get into a war that it, it's not it going to win. It doesn't just include Russia, it includes the Black Death. <laughs> oh, wow. It's like the worst well. ever. Uh, part of this is policy. You're familiar with the one-child policy. You do that for 40 years, you start running out of 30-year-olds. That's, that's how math works. Uh, but most of it just has to do with development. Um, 
When the United States started industrializing and urbanizing, we started back in the early 1800s. And so we have had generations to adapt to a more urbanized environment. And so we have this middle step where we went from farms to small towns, small towns to big towns, big towns to cities, and the cities have suburbs. And so there's always been a degree of elbow room put into the American model, which lowers the opportunity cost of having children. China didn't start to urbanize until 1980. And then they did it all at once. So people in a single generation went from living on a subsistence farm to a high rise condo. And so they went from having seven kids to one kid in one generation. The one child policy was on top of that. And now that it's been more than 40 years, they don't have a lot of people aged under 40. There's no one left to have the next generation. So this was always going to be the last generation for the People's Republic. It was always going to be a two generation experience total. But it's happened so fast that we don't even have an economic theory developed. You know, humankind does not have an economic theory for what would allow the Chinese economy to function in 2030. It's that far gone. Really? I, I, look, when I hear things like that, I go, okay, well, if the United States, look, people in the U.S. are having fewer kids, it's not that bad. Also, we have immigration, right? We say, hey, we need more young, skilled laborers. Come on in. And we offer a bunch of, what is it, a J-1 or an H-1B? I always forget what these visas are. And we get a bajillion applicants and tech companies in Silicon Valley and companies all over New York and elsewhere just pick from the cream of the crop. And the problem is kind of solved, isn't it? Eh. In the United States, we are a large population, 330 million. Uh, in order to round out our younger age groups, we really need to bring in about two to four million immigrants a year. And we're well under that right now. And that is something that will come back to bite us again and again and again in the decades to come. But we're also a settler society. None of us are actually from here. And so the United States is capable politically of sustaining large volumes of immigration for an extended period of time. Just now is not one of those moments. Native Americans are gonna email me and be like, actually, and look, we okay, most of us are not actually from here. How's that? Fair enough. Yeah. Most of our descendants are not from here. Right. Or most of our antecedents, excuse me. Right, antecedents, yeah. Uh, immigration can be part of our solution. There's a lot of complications in that conversation, politically, logistically, that's a different conversation we can get into if we want to. But the United States is the largest economy in the world with the greatest upward mobility from people from the lower classes to the higher classes. And the attractiveness of that system, especially since it's mostly free, is, is robust. And you're right that when we do decide to have an open immigration system, we usually have no problem drawing in people. And that's before you consider what's about to happen to the wider world, where the, the, the delta between the U.S. and everyone else is going to be huge. So that is we'll, we'll that get to that in a second. Hmm? Yeah. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. I, I definitely want to hear about that. I'm curious, though, that people will say, well, how come China can't just change their immigration policy and bring in a bunch of skilled people? They might even be able to offer better incentives than the United States. I disagree with that statement, but and I'm pretty sure you do as well. I would say there's three reasons that won't work. Number one is scale. The United States has over 300 million people. The Chinese have about 1.3 billion. So, so to move the needle, you don't just need to bring in three times as many people. You need to bring in 10 times as many people under age 40. It's not clear that there are enough people that are potentially migrant <laughs> to salvage just China, assuming no one else moves anywhere else. Uh, number two, the United States has a lot of, has, a, has developed an interesting reputation of late of being a little bit racist with white people being a little sketchy. But in China, which is 90% Han Chinese, they are blindingly racist to anyone who is mm -hmm. not Han. Uh, and to think that there are going to be incentives that will draw people, especially in numbers, to the PRC is ridiculous, even before you consider the disconnect in terms of economic activity. But third, there's the governing system. You know, the U.S. It may be a flawed democracy, but a democracy it still is. China is a country where you are welded into your room when there's a health crisis, uh, just the degree that the dis casual dismissal of the very concept that private citizens have agency or interests is something that does not attract migrants. Yeah, I, if I'm looking for a place to move, my life would have to be 
a pretty bad. Well, first, I'd apply to a place like the U.S. or Europe because I can walk around freely. My life would have to be really bad to go, OK, I know that people die in fires from being welded into their house. And I know that they read all of my messages on my phone. I mean, I would have to be in a place like maybe uh, Guatemala or Honduras in a poor area where drug cartels and criminals are running roughshod over my physical safety in order to find a place like China better than uh, my current lifestyle. Well, so the, the calculation to to just Cuba, changes. Mexico or the United States first. Right, of course. Yeah, of course. So so that's a problem. Then. And, and I think people don't realize that you can't just flip an immigration switch in even in places with a with the infrastructure and the culture of immigration. It's hard to change in a place that doesn't ever have it. It's going to be a huge it's going to be a, kind of a Herculean task. Yeah, to China fill that has gap. never had net inward migration. It's always been outward, people trying to get out, not people trying to get in. Huh, did not know that. I assumed at some point they would have had inward migration, but maybe you have to go back like 2,000 years or something not like that then. to find that. Now, there not is migration wow. within the Chinese system. People forget that China is not a traditional nation state. It is an empire, right. and they have expanded out and conquered other groups, and you do get migrant from those poorer minorities into the urban centers. But again, you can only do that once because then you've hollowed out the countryside, and that is what has happened writ large throughout the entire system at this point. Yeah, you, there's a whole, I, it's, I've been studying China for years, there's this whole, uh, it's called huko, and it's like almost like a culture of, I mean, this means a lot of different things, but there's a whole culture of young people, and by young I mean 20 to 50, move from the countryside to the nearest city, work in a factory, leave their kids in the countryside with grandma and grandpa to essentially be raised, see their parents occasionally, money gets sent back, but nobody goes, all right, we're done, we're gonna move back to the countryside. Once those older folks die, that village just starts Empties. to hollow out, and that's the end of it. And, and we've seen that across the system. Uh, the, the, the average age in, in some of these cities is upwards of 50% higher what it is in the cities. Yeah, that, that, that completely makes sense, that the, the age is just completely skewed. How does this then result in, and I know this is going to be sort of a, a large question here, but how does this result in what, what you term deglobalization? And what, what does that actually mean? <laughs> well, it's going to mean something different for everyone. Uh, rem oh, sorry, bump the table. <laughs> rem remember that there are two aspects, two things you need for globalization to work. Number one, you need the physical interconnectivity, the, the transport systems that are low cost and very, very safe. Uh, the lower the cost of transport per unit, the more steps you can get in your supply chain, the greater capacity there is to expand into things that otherwise would be so low cost that you wouldn't trade them internationally. Things like wheat, for example, or plastics. Uh, second, you need a balance of production and consumption, and that in many ways is a subset of demographic structures. So you need to have a significant number of people in your 40s, 50s, and early 60s in order to generate the capital and the skilled labor base to produce, but then you also need a lot of people in their 20s and 30s to do some of the lower skilled stuff as well as consume. And this all has to be in balance for it to work. The, the demographic aging we've seen in recent decades means that that second piece is just completely gone. And countries in, are increasingly finding it in, in their best interest to kind of hoard what consumption they do have and not allow trade access to it, and then producing more locally. We were moving this way before the Ukraine war, before the Chinese started to break down, and before the German industrial model started to implode. Uh, this has just sped everything up. As for the first and with transport, you know, they're, we're kind of we're kind of in this hanging moment where we're waiting for someone to take the first shot now mm -hmm. that the Americans lack the capacity to protect the system. But even if we don't get a formal conflict over transport, uh, by everyone kind of hoarding the production and consumption zones for themselves, we no longer have a vested interest anywhere in the world in what happens over the horizon. And as long as that is the case, we can get regional transport breakdowns that from our point of view don't affect us. But from everyone else's point of view, it's a bit of a disaster. And the more linked in your country is to these networks, the more vulnerable you are. So China, Korea, Germany, very much so at the very top of that list for different reasons, but they're all dependent upon the inflow and outflow. And so you can damage global transport significantly before the Americans really notice not only is the United States one of the world's biggest mining countries for raw materials, so is Canada, so is Mexico. Brazil isn't that far away, and it's all in the same hemisphere. So you can have an eastern hemispheric breakdown, which today 
three quarters of population, three quarters of energy, three quarters of food production, three quarters of manufactured goods. And for the most part, the Western hemisphere actually does better. Hmm. Okay. So can you give us an example of what this means in a specific sector, like smartphones, right? If, if we just don't have the ability to manufacture components in all these different places and move them into one place to then get manufactured and then ship those out to be sold, what is that? What happens, right? Because I can't even imagine this world where that system doesn't exist anymore. Sure. Well, the uh, the smartphone industry is probably simultaneously the most sophisticated and spread out in terms of globalization and manufacturing and the most vulnerable. That's why I picked it. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so the iPhone has 1,400 supply chain steps that touch 50 different countries. Uh, so you'll get the plastics probably from a precursor material that comes from the United States. You'll get the copper probably from Chile, but it's probably processed in China. It's probably built into an integrated cir circuit in Taiwan with the design happening in California. And the system on a chip that kind of ties it all together is probably from Japan, but it is made out of components from throughout Southeast Asia and so on and so on and so on. You miss one of these, you don't have a phone. <laughs> Uh, and what we're what discovered, what the what Apple has discovered under Tim Cook, you know, Tim Cook was brought in to operationalize the supply chain to make it the most efficient it was. It could be, and in doing so, ninety percent of those supply chain steps now in some way touch China. And what we've discovered with these COVID lockdowns of the last two weeks is that the facilities are no longer functioning. So Apple has stopped. I have a phone that I ordered two months ago that was supposed to be delivered two weeks ago. And now I've been received a notice that it's probably not even been built yet. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that they were that far behind. I figured yeah, well, they just... They do have a facility in China with 100,000 people. Whoa. And so, you know, when that goes offline, eh, do the math. Yeah. Uh, now, this is not the death of Apple. Mm -hmm. They've got billions in the bank. They can rebuild their supply chain in other oh, places. You already paid for the phone. They're, they're fine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But that's a five-year process. So this iPhone that I'm trying to get is probably the last one for a while until they completely rebuild their supply chain so it's China-free because China is no longer a reliable manufacturing partner. Oh, wow. And they're going to have to do that in places they don't have operations. You don't do that overnight. You don't do that cheaply. And Apple will be doing this at the same time other sectors are trying to do the relocation at the same time. Sure. So because of demographic reasons, we have an absolute cap on how much labor we have available in the United States. Same with Canada. Mexico is in a better position, but there's still an upper limit. So everyone who's trying to nearshore or reshore or friendshore at the same time has to compete for an absolute upper limit of labor availability. And we're now seeing that happen across the entire manufacturing world. Oof, that that seems, I mean, the, the, the gravity of this is extreme because when we start looking at, okay, we have to move all this, Oh, and so does every other company. So now they need to find people that were in places where they can build factories, get the property, get the licenses, have the local fixers do whatever they need to do, except now 500 or 5,000 companies need to do the same thing with the same staff in the same place. The prices are going to go up. The amount of people that can help them do this is going to just be, it's finite. First of all, they just can't work on 8,700 projects at once. It's not possible. And all of that kind of has to happen at the same time, or at least they're in a race to do that because otherwise they can't really make money. Yeah, the smart firms started this process in the last year of the Obama administration. Now, maybe for wildly different reasons. And then it accelerated under Trump because he launched a trade war and then accelerated more under COVID. And now it's accelerated under Biden because Biden's even more economically nationalist. And now we've hit the wall. <laughs> Wow. So can is there a way to avoid this? You mentioned imperialism no. or mercantilism. <laughs> uh, neither sound very appealing if you're on the wrong end of that. Uh, imperialism, we kind of know what that is, right? We go and take over some other place. Mercantilism, what is what is that? I remember vaguely learning about this Mercantilism is basically what we're hitting. It's where mm -hmm. you exercise a degree of trade restriction in order to limit people's access to your market, but you try to shove stuff down their throats to destroy their local industry whenever you can. Certainly the first part of that is going to be the norm for the next several years. The second part, we'll see what happens once the, the supply chains have been relocated. Now, 
And I realize this is ugly. Uh, in the United States, this is 10% plus inflation for several years as we get all this stuff in place. Same in Mexico, same in Canada. But on the backside, we will have a supply chain system that employs people from the continent that is simpler and shorter with fewer steps, that is cleaner, that uses less energy. And at the end of it, when it's done, we will have a supply chain system that is largely immune to international crises. And we're going to have record economic growth while we're building this. This is going to be a great story. High inflationary, yes, but people forget about the high growth part. Now, that's assuming you are affiliated with the North American network as we basically take our marbles and go home. I see. If you are someone else trying to sell in, you've got to cut a deal. And there are not a lot of countries that have prepositioned themselves like that. And, and this is because America has the beneficial defensible geography, a lot of skilled labor, the ability to bring in immigrants, uh, a lot of the raw material, the things we talked about before. Because so, of the Shell Revolution, the cheapest energy in the world and the largest cluster of millennials for consumption in the world. Shale revolution being that we can get oil out of shale, which is something that I guess was too expensive before, just for people that haven't heard that. Yeah, that so term. the shale, shale technologies as of 15 years ago when the sector started, it probably cost you about 100 to $150 a barrel to produce the stuff. Now we're below 35 Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. And, and skilled labor, you mentioned this earlier, you sort of hinted at this, and I said I wanted to get to it. High skilled labor is going to be leaving other countries and coming to America in part because, well, furthering the demographic crisis those countries are having. But why else is this going to happen? Just simply because we're going to see that growth and maybe it's not going to happen in those other places? If you've got growth and security and food supply and energy supply here and you don't other places, you know, people will vote with their feet. Uh, for, unfortunately, uh, we're in the process of a bit of a political reshuffling here in the United States and the factions that make up the parties are moving around. And the faction that is most in play is organized labor. And the issue that they are strongest on is not wanting an open migration system. So we are incapable at the moment in the United States for having a meaningful conversation about migration. And until that passes, until we know where organized labor ends up, uh, we are missing a wonderful opportunity here to take the best and the brightest from the rest of the world. And it's not just an issue of providing labor. I mean, think about it. If, if somebody has a college degree, that means they have 16 years of education. And if they come to the United States, a foreigner comes to the United States, that means someone else paid for that. I mean, it's like by the numbers, immigration's brilliant. So who gets screwed in this situation the most? We talked about why America is going to be largely safe from this and even benefit from this. You mentioned if people are part of the North American, I can't remember the word you use, but the sort of North America club, right? Does that mean Mexico and Canada are largely isolated from this because they have the U.S. Uh, on their on their doorstep, for better or for worse? Canada, if it was on its own, would be totally screwed, but it's attached to the United States via first a bilateral trade deal and then ultimately by NAFTA. And it has a lot of the same defensive capacity. So yes, Canada is going to be just fine. They've got some internal stuff they'll have to shake out, but they always have. So that's <laughs> that's par for the course. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico is the highest value add economy in the world if you compare the cost of the inputs versus the value of the outputs. And so I would expect Mexico to be one of the three most quickly growing economies in the world for the next 30 or 40 years. Wow. There are a short list of other countries, whether that they saw this coming or just sheer luck, have entered into trade deals with the Trump administration uh, and are probably going to be fine. Uh, the top of that list is Japan. Japan came to the U.S. seeking a deal, knowing it was going to be humiliating, and Trump obliged. <laughs> but, but then when Biden came in, the Japanese made it very clear they don't want to change the terms. Mm -hmm. So they saw a lot of these deglobalization and depopulation trends coming a long time ago because they were, in many ways, the cutting edge. They are the demographically the oldest society in the world. Uh, and so they knew that they had to have access to a real market. So that whole Toyota mantra of build where you sell, that's not just a slogan. That's a national survival strategy for the Japanese. And they have found a way to swallow their pride and attach themselves to NAFTA. So I think they're going to be okay. Uh, I'd watch Southeast Asia pretty closely. We've got good relations with most of them. The one that matters the most by, most by far is Vietnam. Good educational system, decent demographic structure, and they're trying to leapfrog China in terms of technological aptitude, and they're doing a decent job mm -hmm. of it. 
uh, they are definitely the country that has benefited the most from China dropping pieces of the manufacturing systems. Do we think China is going to, I, I use words like survive, and I know it sounds dramatic, so I, I want to avoid doing that. But no, it's I, I all think right. Survive's the right word. And survive no. is the right word? Yeah. I mean, do we see parts of China surviving this demographic crisis, this uh, global deglobalization crisis, and joining global markets again? I mean, it's just so hard to imagine a place like Shanghai, right on the the ocean, tons of educated people, tons of infrastructure, just being like, well, this place sucks, everybody out. I mean, it seems like they would- There's nowhere figure, to go. <laughs> there, there is nowhere to go, right. And also, but there's a lot of talent there. There's a lot, of, there's yeah. just a lot there. Is that, is it possible we're gonna see a Hong Kong style, almost like a separation, a, a cutout of a place like Shanghai and some of these other markets and in, in, in places in China that Let that me do give well? you the caveat first, especially when you're talking about demographics in China, we can only rely on the data we have. Right, and which with is the provided Chinese by the now CCP. admitting publicly that it's all been fabricated, mm -hmm. uh, this fastest aging society in human history, that's the fabricated story. That's the best case scenario. The reality is significantly worse. And even if you believe the data on its face, Shanghai and Beijing already have the lowest birth rate of any metros in human history. Wow. So the pace of the disintegration here is really difficult to wrap your mind around. And I think disintegration is the word. We are looking at the end of China as a political entity within a decade or two, and as an ent and an economic entity within a decade. Wow. Whether or not the CCP survives that, that is an open question, because for the CCP, economic growth is no longer perceived as the path to legitimacy. So there, the, the politics can go in a lot of weird directions. But let's talk about the country as a whole. It will not be able to hold together. It will not be able to fuel and feed itself. And in that sort of environment, the capacity of Beijing and the Northern Core to control all the outlying territories is absolutely going to come into question. Now, China has only existed as a unified entry entity for about 10% of its three millennia of history. It is usually fractured apart. Mm. And in situations where it has been together and then it's broken down, what, what usually happens is the Northern zone turns into a famine reddit hellscape uh, <laughs> where there's not energy, there's not food, there's a bit of a low grade civil war and the central government is desperate to oppress people into unity. And it's an ugly, ugly place to live. They'll probably lose half of their population. Oh home. my God. Like, b because of migration or because of starvation? And, starvation. And, oh God, that's terrible. Then the southern cities from Shanghai on south, you're right. This is where the value add is. This is where the cosmopolitan is. This is where the bulk of the higher value added manufacturing is. And this is where foreigners are more exposed and where they, we might actually feel it. If northern China were to vanish tomorrow, we might not notice. Yeah. But those southern cities, that's the part that's internationally wired. So historically speaking, these cities become de facto independent city states and they interface with foreign countries and companies in order to access technology and finance and food. And then that's metabolized by local labor to participate in an international supply chain of some form. And then everything in the interior regresses. China's no stranger to this, right? They've had, I mean, we're talking about Macau, Hong Kong, uh, probably also Shanghai earlier in its history were really kind of isolated little economic city states that in, in, in many ways kind of still are, and they could just, they could just go back to that mode. I don't know how yeah, much there's, the a, there's a very strong like level it. here for, for most of the last 1500 yeah. years, those city states have imported most of their food from abroad. It's, it's only in this most recent iteration that they've been interlinked in terms of economics and food supply in Northern China. This, this is, this is a very new development for China. China, what, how are they even stable now? I mean, look, I've, the obvious answer is there's a lot of repression uh, and the CCP is a very strong centralized authority. They must spend for stability. They must spend a lot of money. Well, let's look at the outside and then work towards the inside. So on the okay. outside, they can still access global energy. They can still access global food. They can still access global food input, inputs. As long as that is going on, people will be fed and the lights will be on. Now, they are utterly incapable of influencing those events. So when they break, there's nothing the Chinese can do about it. Uh, and we're probably going to see in the next few months significant energy failures out of the Russian space where the Chinese are going to bear the disproportionate burden of that. So we're not, we don't have to wait too long for the external environment to look nasty. 
uh, internally, when you've got this heterogeneous system, the two things you do are number one, you beat the crap out of anyone who steps out of line. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a national security state in every way you can imagine it. And then second, you basically pay everyone to be on the, on the same side. So, you know, we, we bitch in the United States about the Federal Reserve and QE and devaluing the dollar and printing currency and debt spending and all that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, that's, that's a relevant conversation to have. The Chinese do it about an order of magnitude more than we do. Huh. Wow. Uh, so everything that if you're a gold bug, everything you believe about the United States, it's much more true <laughs> for the People's Republic. Now, they do not have an internationalized financial system. So this all stays bottled up. Uh, one of the reasons why whenever the Chinese do try to liberalize their accounts so they can be a global currency or whatever the, uh, the spasm of the day happens to be, a trillion dollars floods out in a matter of months as people try to get their money to someplace where it'll hold its value. Uh, but it doesn't take much to pop that because basically we're looking at subprime, the American subprime experience, but not just across the entire housing sector, but in every economic sector. And the subsector of China where this financial hyper, hyper financialization is most exposed is agriculture. So they're going to get hit from labor, from finance and raw material supply all at the same time. Oh, That's going to kill a half a billion people. That's so that's so crazy to 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 think about. I thought they were mostly going to. I, I thought it was it would be the real estate bubble that pops, right? You know, because they've that's the a only yeah. the only place to invest in China if you're a Chinese is essentially to buy an apartment that's not built yet somewhere else with the promise that the value is going to go up, and then the developer often will just not build it or build the concrete structure, and then there's nothing else. So the, the value kind of never, in many of these places, that's why you have those ghost cities that are built, but they're kind of not finished, and then no one lives there, and there's nothing there. And it's like, that, this that is very just well investment. could be the proximate cause. Just remember, we're dealing with somebody who's walking on a tightrope between two pickups going 90 down the highway if they go off a cliff into a whirlpool where a meteor is hitting. It doesn't really matter what the proximate cause is. <laughs> right. Okay. Any of these things can end it. Right, right. No, that 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 actually makes sense. It seems like a very fragile ecosystem uh, financially. Well, not just financially. I mean, with all of these different inputs. And and I think again to sort of clarify the shipping what are what are we really afraid of with these shipping routes? If the United States isn't securing them, are there really that many pirates out there going and disrupting these things or are we worried about something else? Cuz I think a lot of people are like, "Wait, so now nothing's going to be able to get shipped if the navy pulls out?" There, there's a number of ways this can break down. The, the history of maritime transport is very rich with examples of security threats. So, you know, you've got pirates, you've got state pirates are basically, you know, people using their Navy to do stuff. Mm. And then you've got privateering, which are private entities that have kind of a state charter in terms of having a place to uh, fuel and sell their, sell their booty. I just, it's, it's fun that that is becoming part of the lexicon again. Uh, uh, but let's focus on insurance. You can't sail anywhere. You can't leave and leave port without an insurance policy. And at the moment, an insurance policy costs about 1% the value of the ship itself to be paid out in installments over a 12 month period. So oh, 1% wow. is the total. Of dollars. Yeah. yeah, but it's only 1%. Now that assumes that no one is shooting at anyone anywhere. If you sail into an area where there is a conflict, the cost of that policy increases by a factor of 100 Oof. to be paid weekly. That assumes that no one is shooting at civilian shipping. If right, that's that just happens, accidental. You might hit a mine kind, right. kind of stuff. If people yeah, are going be, you're after just, You're ships. in a bad neighborhood, so we're going to charge you more. Right. But if someone starts shooting at a civilian vessel, you cannot get an insurance policy at all. So the Europeans have set up an environment with this price cap where a lot of countries in Northern Europe now have a financial and security reason to go after Russian shipping. I would argue that the more China acts like a bag of dicks, the more countries in Southeast Asia are developing an interest in going after that shipping. And while I don't think the Chinese are going to ever go after Taiwan, I think it would be national suicide. We are in an environment where that is plausible. And I can totally see the US Navy, the guarantor of global maritime shipping, stopping the oil flows from the Persian Gulf to the Chinese coast. 
it doesn't happen to ha have to happen everywhere. The whole world doesn't have to be a no sales zone. You just need to happen in a handful of environments to raise the cost of shipping to a point that most manufacturing no longer makes sense. Because remember, if you've got a thousand step supply chain, transport has to be no more than two or 3% of the cost of the entire thing. So shipping from step to step to step to step has to be cheap, has to be quick, has to be reliable, has to be safe. If you change that, if you just increase the cost of shipping by double, you've already eliminated over half of the global manufacturing supply steps uh, viability. That doesn't take a, that doesn't, you don't have to move the needle very far to get there. Right, that makes sense, right, because all we need to do is double the cost of some transistor that goes in something, and it's like, well, that now it no longer makes sense to have that thing made in China. It's actually twice the price to ship it, so we might as well make it in, I don't know, literally anywhere else where we can at least get it safely and in reliable numbers. And these little, it's almost like you've got a beverage in front of you, and someone's got a little dropper, and they have motor oil in there, and they go, bloop, and you go, damn it, and now I, I don't can't that drink anymore. that. <laughs> right? right, like, most of it is still fine, you just, but it's it's enough, that, that is enough to make it impossible, or at least very inadvisable, to take another swig of that old-fashioned, because there's a, there's there's something in there, and you don't, you, maybe you can't even see where it is until it's too late. So, it, and this is a tortured metaphor here, I suppose, but this seems like we really don't need a lot of disruption in a lot of different areas to make the whole thing get screwed up and oil comes to mind right if we have russian african middle east north african oil without american overwatch then once production is offline even for a few months the wells might freeze up the workers go home and find different jobs the equipment stops working or falls into disrepair you can't just then go back turn the heater on crank the thing up and start drilling the oil again. It doesn't really work like that from it what I It depends where you are. In, in Siberia, it certainly doesn't work that way. And a lot mm -hmm. of offshore, it certainly doesn't work that way. Uh, some oil production, actually a lot of oil production is a little bit more modular in that regard. But once you break down the rule, like, like just to pick something here, South Sudan, not a place that I would ever put my money, but they are an oil producer. If that shuts down for any reason, and you're dealing with civil collapse and breakdown and civil war already, no one's going to go back. It's like there's there's an right. argument to maintain <laughs> things once they're running because you've got it all in place. But once the moneymaker is gone for like a year, it's not like you can just walk back in and start operations up. And that's going to be the case in Iran. And that is going to be the case in Libya. And that's going to be the case in parts of Algeria. And we've forgotten in 2022 that the Middle East is a bit of a disaster. It's like with the drama of Ukraine war, we're just like, oh my, thank God that the Middle East is calm. It's not, nothing's changed there, except the United States is no longer present. So the next time we have a crisis, someone else gets to deal with it. Woof, I mean, I, all right, so oil, for people who are like, wait a minute, I'm still confused. Oil prices are usually pretty fragile because one disruption mess, messes up the whole system. It's not elastic like other things. I remember that from kind of Econ 102 back in college. And it doesn't help that most oil in the world is located in a sketchy place, as you alluded to earlier. By, by the way, I always meant to ask you this. Is, is that a coincidence or does having large amounts of commodities in your area just cause governments to focus on extraction to the detriment of literally everything else in their well, nation? It depends and upon what you else you have. So if you look yeah. at the Middle East, you're talking about an area where the, their biggest industries were pearling, frankincense, and fishing. <laughs> And in desert communities, pre-industrial, you're talking about very small numbers of people. And then you stick a straw in the desert and you get oil. And obviously you're going to focus on that. So you get the, the Dutch disease, if you will. Uh, in comparison, uh, Norway was an advanced technocratic society with basic manufacturing and hydropower and nickel processing before they discovered oil. Or look at Texas. It was one of the world's largest economies. If, if it had been an independent country, it would have been a trillion dollar economy before the shale revolution. So when you have crude, it doesn't necessarily make you a failed state. It depends upon what was there before. Gotcha. Yeah, because I, I, I just, look, cor correlation isn't causation and all that, but I look but at some of these But there is a places, correlation, yes. Yeah, and I go, good God, what, did this, what happened to this place? Or what is going on here? Uh, speaking of disasters, what about getting Venezuela back online? I know Biden was trying to do that. I mean, I have concerns. I assume you do as well. Well, let's start with what Biden was doing. He was basically saying that 
Venezuela, the state, owes a lot of entities in the United States, not just in the petroleum sector, a lot of entities, a lot of money. So we will loosen the sanctions a little bit so that the crude that you produce can be sold and you never see that money. Ah, that okay. money goes to the American firms that you owe money to. And if you can keep this up and not be a jerk about it, then a year from now, when you've paid off those debts, we will then begin a more serious conversation about the broader environment. So it's an if, 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 then. So, I mean, do I think that Maduro is a great governor? No. Do I think he's the kind of person that should be allowed to be in, in control of Venezuela for the long run? Not really. I'd argue that maybe we're not the people to make that decision. That should be the Venezuelans. But we're just, we're setting the stage for theoretically what comes next. And if Maduro decides to go back to his old habits, then this dissolves in a day and it's no harm to us. Right, because we got the oil and then the money or whatever we needed out or, of the I mean, if it stops tomorrow, we're not in any worse place than we were the day before. I suppose that's true. Yeah. Now, if your goal is to actually get Venezuela back to its peak of producing three to five million barrels a day, that's a different conversation. Because we have had full-on state collapse complete with famine across the Venezuelan space. And this isn't Saudi Arabia where it's an easy field close to the coast. You've got a line of coastal mountains, then you've got your population belt, and your oil's below that. So if you want to resurrect Venezuela, you need to send in at least 50,000 troops and physically rebuild the country from the ground up over the course Oof. of a decade. And then you have the, um, the option of spending two to $300 billion to resurrect the world's most complicated oil production system. And you will not get your first oil. And if you start today, you will not get your first oil most likely until at least 2035. That's insane. So that sounds hopeless for them. Well, it's not something we are interested in. Yeah. But if you fast forward a year or two and the Middle East is being the Middle East again and the Russian oil is gone and the Americans have basically built a little wall around their own energy markets, then you're going to have global energy prices that on a cheap day are looking like 150 and are typically over 200. And in that sort of environment... Dollars per barrel. Yeah. yeah. And wow. in that sort of environment, the Europeans are like, huh, hey, Washington, would you, would you mind if we colonized Venezuela? What, what sort of deal can we strike that you'll just let that happen? And you say colonize, but it's not really a joke because it's almost like that's what has to happen. Countries that, with I mean, large oil that's markets. That's the scale of what has to happen here. And keep in mind that this is not the 1800s when the Europeans had the gun and everyone else had spears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hugo Chavez, Oof. one of his last big acts before he died is he distributed 150,000 AK-47s to the population. So anyone who thinks that this is going to be easy is wrong in every possible way. Oh my gosh, it, it, it's just, it does sound like recolonialization where countries with large oil markets have to secure their own supply from another place that can export it, but they don't have the security to do it themselves. Yeah. Libya, Algeria, so, probably also part of this problem, our same situation. Uh, I mean? Libya has a similar situation of populations on the coast. The infrastructure runs through the populated areas, but the oil's deep in the desert. Now, because it's not tropics, because there aren't a lot of mountains, because the population is so much smaller, it would be easier. But the only country that I think is likely to consider that would be Italy. And I don't know how well you know your colonial history, but every time that Italy has tried to have a colony in the last 300 years, it's been a shit show. And I don't have any reason to expect it would be any. Yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, we don't have any reason to expect that it would be any different uh, this time around. It's, I mean, just given, yeah, it, it, Italy's another fun place to watch because it just go, you just go, wait a minute, r really? Is this, the, is this real news? I can't believe it. Okay, <laughs> well, but and I it's, guess. And it's crazy because yeah. the northern third of Italy where the half the population lives, that's more technologically advanced than Japan. Mm -hmm. in, in, in output per hour worked, it's more productive than Northern Germany. That's shocking, but, actually. But Just knowing Italy. my <laughs> Italian friends who live yep. in Italy still, yeah, that's, yep. they, they must not live in that part of Italy. <laughs> or, or maybe they do, but they're just dragged down by the rest. You know, the yeah. southern half is, is a bit of, of a crazy. But in order to make that northern mm. third work, they have to have access to, to gobs of energy. So they actually have a pretty sophisticated energy system. They can take any flavor of crude and mix it to make uh, something that any of the refineries can run. One of the few places in the world that can do that. But they have to still be able to source the crude. And in a post-American deglobalized world, that becomes a big problem. Italy's right next door. I'm sorry, Libya 
is right next door. Libya is right next door. Yeah, indeed. But okay, I know people are going to go, this is why we need green energy to replace oil. Can that actually happen? I'm a layman. It doesn't sound like it's right around the corner. Well, the idea is really sexy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. if, if you can get enough copper and zinc and everything else, then you can basically declare independence from petroleum. And that sounds great. But making electricity is a lot more sophisticated than an internal combustion engine. I mean, internal combustion engine, I'm oversimplifying here. Uh, you light a match, you burn something, you capture the heat, you go. That, that, that's what it is, basically. Uh, if you want an electricity storage system and transmission system, you need an order of magnitude, more machinery, more materials, and more different kinds of materials. You need your cobalt, you need your lithium, your copper, your zinc, and all the rest. And that means that you may, if you're successful, be able to declare independence from a world dominated by Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, and Russia. But it now means that you have to be inexorably, inextricably linked to Canada and Mexico and Bolivia and Chile and Brazil and Argentina and Peru and Vietnam and Indonesia and Malaysia and Australia and Pakistan and India and China <laughs> and Kazakhstan and Mongolia and Turkey and Algeria and, oh yeah, still Russia. Because so, of rare earth metals and stuff like that? Well, is that why? That's not, I mean, rare earth is like one of the few things that we actually have covered. You need at least five times as much of all of these materials as the globe produces right now to make the green transition work. It's a lot of copper. And we just don't have production capacity necessary to support this on a global scale. And we're losing the Russian stuff. And very soon we're going to lose the Chinese processing capability. So if you're going to apply these technologies, you are only going to apply them in places where so a good solar belt, a good wind belt. That's the American Southwest. And that's sick. But there are not a lot of places where people live. Locations. Right. And you can't just transport be with a bajillion miles of lines. It has to yeah. sort of there's no permitting problem. A thousand mm -hmm. miles is since that you can ship power. Well, and, and I probably should do a whole show on this here because that seems like, okay, fine. Don't worry about the wind. Don't worry about the sun. New uh, nuclear is great. There's just two problems. Disposal of the spent fuel. That's actually the easiest problem. Probable. Yeah. I mean, it's, nobody wants a nuclear repository. Um, problem number two is time relations, assuming that you could just build it, how, whatever you wanted to work years from the point that you put oh, your first money wow. into that's, that's a pretty long Delta. Yeah. And then third, uh, <laughs> is Kazakhstan. Okay. And most ah, of still what tied is to produced Russia. in Kazakhstan in Russia in just fuel rods. Can't do this without the Russians at scale. Okay, so l let's say we fix batteries. Are we just swapping oil issues for rain? That's it, pr provided we figure out how to generate the power in the or to give it up on that. <laughs> but what about batteries, right? Are we just oil issues for rare earth metal and other issues? Aren't an issue. Uh, okay, rare earth gotcha. production is a byproduct of a processing issue, and most of that is done in China because it's expensive. It's just people. The, the Chinese have subsidized the finished product for a low cost. Got it. And it's like get from the Chinese at a third of what it would cost you to do it yourself. But uh, but ten years ago when they uh, tried access, everyone went out and built out the processing. 1920s technology. It's not hard. It's not even expensive. Ah. Done. So if China were to like fall in on itself, we'd probably have about six months that it would take to spin all this infrastructure. It's already been paid for. So we'd be okay with rare earth, copper and lithium. Uh, and getting the world's lithium comes from Chile and they're continuing to produce more and more and more. Copper is primarily Chile again, uh, and Russia. Uh, so and in Indonesia, Jeez. so that the Russian stuff is going away. Uh, we don't have enough of either of those to maintain a moderate green build out in the United States, much less global at scale. 
Now, in a post-globalized system where Chile and Australia are part of the American network, that gives us some opportunities that other countries don't have. You take their production, you concentrate it into the Western Hemisphere for sales. That just might work in places where this makes sense. Uh, but everywhere else, there's just not enough. A lot of folks have asked me, why can't the United States, this is, I'm, I'm shifting gears a little bit here. Why can't the United States replace what China makes with Mexican manufacturing? What's the problem here? You know, there's tons of skilled laborers in Mexico. I know we have to build factories and stuff like that. There's the, there's the whole, that whole idea, but it's not, it doesn't seem impossible to have Mexico replace quite a bit of that. What's Let me wrong give you the good idea? and then the bad. So first okay. the good, we can, we are, and we will. Okay. Uh, the industrial build out in Mexico is epic. And the Mexicans, on average, are more skilled than Chinese laborers, and they're one-third the cost. Huh. So there, there are very, very few economic manufacturing sectors where the Mexicans are not already the low-cost, high-quality producer compared to China. Uh, and so that is proceeding apace. Uh, problems. Number one, there's only 130 million Mexicans. You know, they've got one-tenth the population of China, so they can't do it all. So it has to be a group effort with the United States and Vietnam and others uh, involved. Uh, so we have to basically relocate a whole lot of industrial plant. You don't do that overnight, no matter how right. desperate your situation is. Uh, second, electronics. What makes East Asia dominant in electronics is they've got a labor system that taps 12 different labor markets with different skill sets, all in close proximity. So you do the injection molding in one place, the die cast in another, you make the wires in one place, the wiring harness in another, you process the copper in one place, you make the semiconductor in another. And it's doing all of these things differently, efficiently, and then bringing them together for assembly at yet another place. In North America, we have two labor markets. We've got the US and Canada, which are broadly the same, high tech. And then we've got Mexico, which does middle manufacturing very well. It's the delta between them that gives you good economies of scale and network effects for electronics manufacturing because there's so many steps. Well, only in the US-Mexico border region do we get that interface. So we don't have the 12 step labor market that the Asians have, which means that we're going to have to retool everything that we bring back in the electronics space uh, in order to do it at scale. And that's going to look very different. And we are going to have to make that up as we go. And that will probably be the economic sector where we feel the most pain from the changes because it's gonna take the longest. It almost seems like Mexico needs its own Mexico. It does, it's called <laughs> Colombia. Okay, got it. Yeah, so Mexico and Colombia both have Atlantic and Pacific port, uh, both have Atlantic and Pacific ports. And Colombia is very similar in economic structure to where Mexico was 15 to 25 years ago. So more skilled than their price point would suggest. Uh, and the Colombians are absolutely going to be an indelible part of whatever comes next for the greater NAFTA system. Uh, it'll take them a little bit longer to get up and running than it did the Mexicans because Mexico it's right up on the US border. So it's very easy for American entrepreneurs to reach South, find partners and build out. Uh, Colombia is not just in a different continent. Uh, most of the population lives on the sides of mountains. So you've got tropics in the lowlands and snow caps and tundra at the top, people live in the middle. And that makes the infrastructure question a really important one. It's not that the infrastructure is not in place, it is, but it's not built out to supply and support a mass manufacturing culture, which is what we need them to do. That's going to take some time too. No, well, Viva Colombia! Great. Well, they they deserve a break over there. It's been they've had a rough go the past few they decades. They did, but their their last fifteen years yeah. have gotten progressively better. The Civil War is over. FARC is gone. I don't mean to suggest that cocaine has vanished from their world, uh, but they're not facing the degree of state challenge that they have for most of their history. Fantastic. Good. Okay. Well, let's in the time we have left here. I'm so curious. What about food? You know, we, we heard before, this is a few months ago, we heard that r grain can't get out of Ukraine and Russia might be using food diplomacy. The United States might have to use food diplomacy to essentially say, hey, we'll feed your people if you do X, Y, Z. Is that realistic or am I reading too much news? Uh, we were we were very lucky this calendar year. Um, we only had a disruption out of the Russian space for fertilizer production of about one third. And Mother Nature was very kind to us the world over. Most of the world's farmers had great weather all year long. And everyone had a fertilizer reserve. Well, the, the, the amount of stuff that is getting broken down in the Russian system is accelerating. 
Uh, Mother Nature is probably going to be her normal self next year. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the initial forecast, especially for uh, the Western Hemisphere, don't look great. Uh, and everyone has already used their reserves. So we should expect significant fertilizer shortages in, sometime in 2023. Uh, the country to watch is Brazil uh, because they're the world's largest fertilizer importer. And they've, they're a big enough country, they've got the heft to get it. And if they start having problems, you know that there are dozens of smaller countries out there that are already in crisis point. So we'll probably see significant drops in agricultural output next year, especially in the second half of next year, which should suggest that we're going to have significant problems with food supply on a global scale in the months that follow. Ooh. In your opinion, who are going to be the biggest winners and losers in the new world order? The biggest winners, it sounds like the United States. Um, what else? Who else am I missing in terms of winners? And I'd love to hear who you think has really got there, really on the chopping block, so to speak. Sure. So greater NAFTA, U.S., Canada, Mexico is obviously at the top of the list. Colombia, Australia, Japan, and assuming they can get their head out of their ass, the Brits, <laughs> uh, are probably going to be part of the new network that works. Uh, and most of the Western Hemisphere that was not on that list is at a minimum going to be able to benefit from a relatively uh, placid security environment. So they're not going to be dealing with a lot of the changes that are happening in the Eastern Hemisphere. In fact, a lot of these countries are commodities exporters. And so in that sort of environment where your commodities can still be produced, assuming you get the fertilizer, uh, but you don't have to worry about a security concern, your ability to sell high uh, is very promising. Uh, the biggest loser by far is China. Everything about China's functionality is dependent on a globalization and a demographic moment that has passed. Uh, and they are definitely not going to survive as a country, uh, much less as an economy. I think we're in the final decade of the European Union, because without that Russian energy, there is no German manufacturing model. And without the German manufacturing model, you don't have the money that is used to keep the EU in existence. So, I mean, what can you imagine what would happen with the Greek debt crisis if the Germans didn't have the capacity to write a check? Mm -hmm. That's the environment we're going to be in in a few years. Uh, add in terminal demographics and parts of Europe can go their own way and be reasonably successful. Scandinavia, I'm very bullish on. France, I'm very bullish on. But the rest of it looks really, really dangerous. Uh, wow. And then I am really concerned about Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia because they import almost every speck of their potash and their phosphate, and their nitrogen fertilizer, and their food importers on top of that. Oh, man. So we're going to see an, a pretty nasty, ugly famine in those places. Yes. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean state failure. India is a great example of a country that can sustain a very high degree of chaos and just keep on chugging along. But most countries in this part of the world are not as strong as India. In closing here, what keeps you up at night? Aside from all the potentially horrible things we've already discussed, is there anything else that you think, hey, this is something to watch, nobody's talking about it? Oh, no, that's about it. Um, that's about it? <laughs> I mean, the food issue is the issue that gives me nightmares because I don't see a way to fix it. It takes 10 years to bring a new potash production facility online. And the Canadians got started as soon as the war began back in March. Well, I mean, they started in March, the war started in February. But and it, it, they're hoping they can speed it up and get meaningful replacement volumes up by 2029. It just, a lot of this seems really hopeless. And now it all makes sense why you think skilled labor and basically people who have the ability to move are going to all move to places where that aren't going to have these problems. We're going to have an interesting realignment of what is normal in the United States over the next 20 years. Because we've had this populist rise up represented by Biden and Trump, but we're also going to be probably taking in 40 or 50 million migrants over the course of the next 20, 25 years. Wow. That is going to change our complexion because these are not going to be people who walked <laughs> here. These are going to right. be people mostly from advanced countries with degrees and experience who can have an immediate value added impact that is quite a bit different from our normal immigrant draw. This, it's going to be an interesting couple of decades, man. I'm, I, I hate to say I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be interesting to watch, but I also I'm very afraid for the people that are on the losing end of this equation. I think it's going to be that's going to be pretty harrowing. Yeah, this we've had a really good run the last 75 years. It was, it was never going to last. That doesn't necessarily mean it had to collapse in the way that it's going to, though. And it's it's going to be a rough ride. 
Well, Peter, thank you very much for coming back on the show. We'll have you back, uh, I assume, at some point in the next few months as well, because there's always interesting developments. I'm always watching your videos on YouTube, and I will link to all of that in, and the book as well in the show notes. So thank you once again for coming back. No problem. You take care. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.